There will be two parts to this presentation of my work entitled Value Fulfillment. First, I will tell you what the various elements of my composition represent. And then I will speak about what happened during the making of this piece and the significance of what happened in the making of this piece. And then there will be an opportunity for a visually guided contemplation. But first, you remember, I'm sure, how there are as many of this chair in this room as there are people in this room perceiving, therefore, constructing this chair, right? I know it's an unforgettable moment when you first hear about that. And it's not, we also remember that it's not because of the angle, the light, the distance, the mood, the weather, the condition of our visual organs. No. Each one of these chairs is composed of a different set of atoms and molecules. Each one of these chairs is another chair. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? So that it is truly on our part an act of projection of our own psychic energy through a materializing mode and into these many chairs. Well, the same thing that happened to this chair is going to happen to this piece I'm going to show you. I just know that you're going to bombard it with your own brand of atoms and molecules. And usually, this happens by itself. This happens whether or not we know that it is so. But in this case, I am going to ask you to add one specific element to your construction, because I will be speaking of multidimensional realities on a flat two-dimensional surface. Major distortion. Huh? As a result, the elements of my composition are juxtaposed to each other. Whereas we know in reality, fifth dimension, sessions 12 and following, we know that in reality, everything moves through everything. Everything moves through everything in all directions, all dimensions, all modes and all moods. Everything moves through in everything. So I'm going to ask you to add the notion of through to the various elements I will be speaking about. And I will try to remember to make this gesture to remind you to put throughness into your composition, into your constructions. It's magic. Value fulfillment. The texture of sand represents the basic vitality, and I quote, that itself composes from itself all other phenomena. In other words, this represents the basic vitality of the primary energy gestalt, also known as all that is. Some of the grains of sand sparkle, and the sparkles represent mental enzymes. The mental enzymes are the sparks which initiate energy transformation. So this then, this texture, represents the energy that is behind universes. Universes of our own three-dimensional camouflage universe, which is represented here by the silhouette of the tree. Other universes, based on very different root assumptions from our own, different camouflage universes, which we do not usually perceive. Dream universe, the negative matter universe, chemical universe, electrical universe, an infinity of inner universes. Think of an infinity of universes. You see what I mean? And all of the probable versions of all of the above. We're talking about a lot of hoomph here. 
Now, let us look at the attributes, qualities of this basic vitality. It is electromagnetic. Okay. It is subjective, which means that every little jing jing jing, and by jing 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 I mean energy unit, electromagnetic unit, consciousness unit, emotional energy unit, grain of sand. Every little jing 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 is conscious, self-aware, and endowed with capsule comprehension, which means that its very being, its very essence, is equivalent with total knowledge, with the knowledge of all that is and its own place in it. So, this vitality is electromagnetic, it is subjective, and it is action. Action is change, fluid motion. Action is aggressive, violent, and certainly exuberant. Action never stops and never ends because an action brings about new streams of reality which invite their own action. And also because no single action could possibly express or represent all that is. So action never stops and never ends. Action is guided by the principle of value fulfillment, which means that every little jing 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 has the basic necessity to be actualized, to be expressed in all the ways, all the modes, all the directions, and all the dimensions possible, and the possible versions, the probable versions of all of the above. Personally, I comprehend value fulfillment as enthusiasm. I see it as the enthusiasm of all that is, who wants to do and be everything and every non-thing and the probable versions of all of the above. Another aspect of this vitality is a component of inwardness, outwardness. It will be the uh, basic principle of all pulsations and polarities, among other functions. Electromagnetic, subjective, action, value fulfillment, inwardness, outwardness. Now, we need to put all of these attributes of vitality together, and here is how value fulfillment happens. Because they are electromagnetic, a little jing 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 can and do zing up with each other. And by zing up I mean attract and be attracted by, associate with, cooperate with, remember cooperation, one of the laws of the inner universe, play with, form gestalts with. And they do so by aligning their emotional polarities. Think of that. Really think seriously about that. Aligning their emotional polarities is how they zing up with each other. And they first form fields. The various fields are indicated here with their various colors and configurations. They first form fields. This is the beginning of differentiation. Differentiation is a method by which action creates various strands, strains of itself to have something to play with and to act upon. This area here represents the contraction phase of the primal pulsations. And within it, the fields zing up with each other, thereby forming gestalts. They then zing up with each other, forming more complex gestalts. 
And all this activity creates a maelstrom of such compressed intensity that it, with the agency of the mental enzymes, releases itself into the expansion phase of the pulsation. This expansion phase is expressed here by this explosive action, which goes all over, outside of the board, outside of, of the page, into ever expanding, ever accelerating, ever multiplying spirals, because such is the nature of action. Glass is intensely compressed sand. And the pieces of glass in this composition represent intensely compressed consciousness units or emotional energy units. This expansion action itself creates itself into these here massive banks of gestalts of uncamouflaged psychic energy. And these massive banks of gestalts of uncamouflaged psychic energy provide the energetic source for the mental enclosures and for the reality of probabilities. Quote unquote. Here they are, all those massive banks of stuff here. The curly cues in this composition represent the mental enclosures. You notice that they're not full circles because there are no closed systems. Of course, how could there be closed systems since everything moves through everything, huh? Actually, says say they, the mental enclosures, move out like spirals through all reality. Session 287. These mental enclosures then are relative or partial boundaries between spheres of activities. They distinguish, they do not separate or isolate. Now we come to a crucial juncture if we are to understand how all of this works together. With the action of the mental enzymes, these here, psychic gestalts transform themselves into mental enclosures, field within the mental enclosures, and camouflage pattern within the field. In Seth's own words from session 146, the vitality of the universe forms of itself the boundaries of the various fields of activity and the vitality itself takes on the coloration of the various fields and forms the camouflage patterns within them. Mental enclosure, field, and camouflage pattern constitute a system. Not all, but most systems imply materialization. And materialization implies form. But, session 60 to 70, we are told, matter has neither duration nor form. Form, then, is not an intrinsic part of matter. How, then, does form happen? Huh? Well, there is another aspect to the function of the mental enzymes. Within the spark, within the transformation, they project Incipient patterns. Incipient patterns are like pre-patterns, inklings of patterns. They are formed with data, with electrically coded data, and the code is directly related to thought. Session 302. Uh-huh. This is why they're called mental enzymes, huh? These incipient patterns which are represented up here, develop into generic patterns, increasing degrees of differentiation and specialization. 
These, in turn, develop into electromagnetic framework, which becomes the skeleton of form in matter. In other words, this is the form that matter adopts. So now you see, we have mental events, thoughts, ideas, emotions, at the very heart of the creation of material reality. That's what we have here. Again, thought, electrically coded, mental enzymes, incipient patterns, the form that matter adopts. This is how mental events, mental reality creates the form of physical objects and events. Now, we have here as examples a few of the millions of myriads of systems that exist out there. This one, bold looking one here, represents a camouflage system, other, another kind of camouflage system from our own. We do not perceive it. And if we did, we wouldn't understand it. Actually, we do not perceive it because we do not understand it, because it doesn't fit into our perceptual programming, which is also known as root assumptions. It was made from pieces left behind, a box of uh, scraps left behind by an artist who was making buttons. Some of them have holes in them. They are consciousness units, energy, uh, emotional energy units disguised as wood, bone, and stone. They do look alien. They do, the whole system does look somewhat alien, doesn't it? This here is another camouflage system. We wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to us, although most of our mental actions are in, reflected in this system. It wouldn't make sense to us. Plus and minus wouldn't work, up and down wouldn't exist, and so on. I made it from my first practice pieces when I got my new glass cutting saw. It does look somewhat embryonic and primitive somehow. Now, I've arbitrarily situated the birth of the electrical universe in a mental enclosure here. But we know that um, it permeates, the electrical universe permeates all of reality since it is part of its, uh, part of its essence. I cannot suggest the power and the magnificence of this universe. Electricity as we know it, even in its most spectacular thunderstorm manifestations, is but a faint marginal echo of the real thing, says. says. It describes this universe in terms of vastly dense pattern masses with no size, infinite varieties of pulsations, densities of intensities. Think of densities of intensities. Wow. And he says, in session 128, that any mental event or reality which is not expressed in the physical universe has its reality and its existence in the electrical universe. That's a lot of juice. Now, 
this whole development here, remember, describes the expansion phase of the primal pulsation. As such, it expresses the outwardness component of our basic vitality. But expansion, outwardness, necessitates and implies inwardness. And in this system here, I have represented inwardness. It is the contraction phase of all pulsations. It is all implosions, all densifying. It is the mother of all coordination points. Coordination points are inner coincidences between various areas of action, between various systems or actualities. At the level of self, this represents the doorway to inner knowledge, to inner exploration, to insight. to the development of inner senses. As such, it is the mother of all side time. I made it from seashells inward spirals, which I've collected from the beaches of Hawaii. So now, we come to our own system. It is unique in that it is composed of three universes. There is, of course, our own three-dimensional camouflage system, the world we know or think we know. Reality itself, a shadow of realities we do not perceive, says self. Here, I have described some of our root assumptions, or part of our pro perceptual programming, which direct us to perceive the shadows. The little squares here represent the illusion that matter is solid, and that our physical senses give us a true picture of reality. This here represents the illusion that time is made of successive moments, that it only goes in one direction, and that growth is a function of such time. There are four absolute coordination points which intersect all realities. I have placed one of them in our own world here. This is the shell of a baby sea urchin, also from Hawaii. It has a nice little hole in the middle, which is our own practice of side time, our own shortcut to where all realities intersect. This is our night sky, and what we deluded as we are by uh, these root assumptions here, uh, perceive as celestial objects, when in reality, what they are is moment points from other systems which happen to be wafting through our own perceptual fields. This stuff is a lot of fun, really. The second universe in our system is the dream universe up there, the little, the little spheres. Because it somewhat corresponds or is in touch with all other areas of reality, I have used all of the colors of the rest of the composition in there. I was looking for a different 
texture to express this universe. And I found that the dream universe is made from extra chemical emanations from the physical existence. Okay. So I found a somewhat tenuous or far-fetched connection to chemistry in the uh, molecular tension action of little squares of glass. If you put little squares of glass in a kiln at the right temperature, they go and turns into little spheres. I think that is so cute. Anyway, that gave me this extra um, texture as well. The third universe in our system is the negative matter universe. It is composed from excess of energy from the dream universe. It exists between the pulsation of our physical world. It is anti-gravity and anti-space and anti-matter, of course. I've given it one of the other coordination points. Serge says that the dream universe and the universe of negative matter were formed when inwardness attempted to turn itself into a physical matter. Okay, Seth, I'll take your word for it. Huh? So that is our system. Now, come back here. This pretty little system here, I do not know what it is. And as such, it represents all that is unknowable to us. All the millions of myriads of systems which we have no idea of. Seth talks about universes which do not imply materialization. Here they are. Seth, too, talks about an infinity of universes, of chemical universes, where thought is patterned in way, ways that would be totally incomprehensible to us. Here they are. And then, no system, nothing, no number of system could possibly express all that is. Here it is, the unfathomable, the unknowable. There are actualities which are not organized into systems. This here, pyramid gestalt of psychic comprehensions, is one of them. It represents our deities, our divinities. It is Jehovah, Allah, Shango and Yemaya, Inti, Shiva, the Christian God, and so on. If you will remember what I said about the way in which the universe expands, which has nothing to do with space, then you may perhaps perceive, although dimly, the existence of a psychic pyramid of interrelated, ever-expanding consciousness that creates simultaneously and instantaneously universes and individuals that are given through the gift of personal perspectives, duration, intelligence, psychic comprehension, and eternal validity. This absolute, ever-expanding, instantaneous psychic gestalt, which you may call God if you prefer, is so secure in its existence that it can constantly break itself down and rebuild itself. Looks like a beehive, doesn't it? And it is. It's a beehive of psychic comprehensions. This here is a spiral gestalt of perceptual patterns, which is the definition of a self. It's another such actuality which is not organized into a system, a self. This area here 
not very differentiated, somewhat neutral, is somewhat of a birthing place. These things represent planes, symphonies, dimensions, religions, universes, systems that are in the process of inventing themselves. It is the state of becoming. It is infinity. Session 305. Ah, yes, now, the mirror. As you might guess, it is a multi-directional mirror. So that's too speaking of an unimaginable variety of universes says that each has a mirror in each and one reaches out to all others. We could say then that it is the ultimate coordination point. When we look at ourselves in this mirror, we see a reflection, ourselves in our world, we see a reflection of our own moment point within value fulfillment. Of course, I cannot tell you what reality is like from the other side. So I will let Seth, too, give us a hint of the inside view on reality in what is certainly one of the more poetic moments of this material. The very matter of your physical brain has its greater reality in the mind, and behind that mind is another mind, and behind that another, and yet all of this is your mind. The mind of the larger self you do not know. The eye is the symbol of this greater mind, for it sees through all systems and, looking outward, sees infinities of itself dancing into its own eyes. The glances themselves, vital creations and dimensions of consciousness. Wow, oh wow. <sighs> Session 489. Two more points before we break. And as Seth would say, do not lose the pieces, huh? While I was planning and making this, I was making a list as I went along of the elements I was evoking. They are there on this wall behind me. The very fact that all of these notions, all of these aspects of reality can be represented, can be expressed on one sheet of plywood and perceived in one eye glance is in itself my own manifestation of, yes, the spacious present. It's all there, poof, it's all there at once. The other thing I would like to mention is that reality is very happy. Part of my motivation when I started on this project, besides the fun of it, was that I felt the need to gather up what I did know and understand of the reality Seth describes for us. We study this over the weeks, the months, and the years. We understand this here and that then. I felt that my knowledge was so dispersed as to be diffused. And then Seth often talks about something else in the middle of what he's talking about, you know. So I could see that um, as I read and reread the material, that I was understanding more and more, that it became easier and easier to understand, and that it had assimilated more and more. So I knew I was getting somewhere, and then sometimes I also had some um, um, the kind of sight time type of insights and perspective, comprehensions, and experiences. So I knew I was getting somewhere with this. But still, I felt the need for a somewhat linear mental organization of the material. A couple of years ago, I was asked to do a meditation piece evoking the energy of the forest, the energy of fire, and the energy of the tornado. An exciting assignment for sure. Huh? 
an assignment also which easily lent itself to a Sethian type of treatment. And I did couch it, as Seth would say, in terms of transformation of energy. And like the speakers of old, I cannot paint with sound or with tactile sensation. And after reflection, I concluded that the best tool at my disposal to express various stages and states of energy was textures. And I chose to use glass and frit. Frit is the state of glass before it is rolled out, and it comes in um, several sizes of granules so, and the powder, so it is easy to have a variety of textures to play with. I called the piece Energy Transformation. Here it is. It is a simple three-step transformation. The area where all the colors are mixed together represents pure energy. The area on the left and upper left represent the beginning of differentiation and of patterning. The rest of the composition represents the pre-camouflage, the transition into dancing down stage of fire, forest, and tornado. Well, it worked. And it gave me the idea of doing a piece involving more stages and elements of the Seth reality. So I started mentally compiling a list of notions or things or elements that I thought could be represented visually and that I would like to include. But I also needed an uh, organizational framework. I wasn't going to throw stuff on a board like that, huh? And I chose the tree. First, because the tree is an easy kind of organizational visual framework, the branches, spaces between the branches, twigs, and so on. Also, Seth often uses trees in his comparisons and metaphors, but mainly because I see the energy of vegetation in general and the energy in, of the tree in particular as a very particularly direct and genuine expression of basic vitality. Think of the power of germination. Think of the power of the sap wiggling its way up the trunk, wiggling into the branches, into the twigs, into the leaves, and the whole thing wiggling some more in the breeze. The very vitality, the very primeval vitality, straight from the maelstrom of the primal pulsation into our physical world, into our daily lives. The very vitality that we feel when we are aware of our own aliveness, those are the feeling tones that Seth talks about also. So, the tree. Mm -hmm. What was its conceptual function going to be in my composition? Well, I didn't hesitate. I didn't even think about it. It was obvious to me. The tree was going to represent our own camouflage world. At the time I was thinking about this, I didn't have a space where I could do this kind of work, so I was just um, thinking about it, studying Seth, and making notes. And this is what I wrote. The tree represents or symbolizes our camouflage system because that is where we live, that is where we create and perceive, and that is why everything else is hanging on the tree. I vividly and very presently remember writing this. Writing this in innocent excitement. Excitement because I had figured out the main scheme for, for my project. I had an organizational framework. 
My project was a go. Now I really felt this, this was it, this was going to happen. Innocent, because I thought I had it figured out. Now, by setting up the tree, which represents the physical, material, three-dimensional world, as the orga organizational framework for the rest of the piece, for the rest of reality, if of framework too, at the level of self, I was setting up the ego, the part of the self which deals with material reality, as the organizational principle for framework two. And by extension, I was setting the physical senses and the data they give us as the source of knowledge about framework two. Uh huh. Such was the extent of my innocence. Then a year ago, my friend shared her house with me and lent me this nice room to play in here, and I could start the work on this. First thing I did, I painted the bands of intensities. Think of it. Beyond the beyond of the beyond, there are bands of intensities and everything moves through them. You gotta love this stuff. So I painted them on, bright red, bright orange with copper highlights and intense violet. Well, I had to cover them over. They were so intense, I couldn't see anything around them, I couldn't do anything around them. So I painted them over, but they're still there. They are still there in the spacious present, and they even have left little bleed-throughs that you can see here and there on the edges. So I arranged them. At the same time, I was starting on the tree, and I was starting on the idea of branches, like this one I'd started, um, eliminating some areas in which I could situate some actuality. I already had spaces between the trees. And I thought I was going to go on with this general pulsating rhythm all around. But it didn't work. And it didn't work. And then it didn't work some more. For several weeks, I put on uh, motion chalk lines and erased them. And one morning, I put this innocuous little piece up there. At the time, I already had this. I already had this. These were here, but they were still loose. I put this little piece up there, and I suddenly saw the whole thing. I saw that I had to come down and back out. So that now, the other elements of my composition, instead of hanging on the tree, were going to be above, below, and behind or through the tree. That's the only way it would work. I could tell. So, I came here and started working this way. I created the maelstrom there. Then I was having fun coordinating my various strains of psychic gestalts, coordinating and organizing their various levels of mobility, their various styles of mobility, and having a good time, organizing everything in my spaces and starting on the designs within them. But then I got to a point where there were still a lot of things I had no idea how to do. What was I going to do with the electrical universe and others? Negative matter. Wow. I also was wondering if there might be some elements, some aspects of their reality that I haven't thought of including but should be included. And I felt the need to uh, communicate with other students of the Seth reality about this. I was, it was really all by myself out on the limb out there with this. So 
I invited my local fellow Sethis to come and participate in this fun creative endeavor. And we did, we had a fun zing up of a meeting. We talked about the concepts, of course, the motion, the colors, the proportions, the composition. I got some good suggestions. Someone, for example, suggested using copper wire to express the electrical universe. And I hadn't really thought about using metal, but it worked. I also got a lot of good encouragement. But the main thing that happened during this meeting is that some people said, but Cecile, you have all of this energy, all of this power like coming out here, but everything moves this way. What? At the time I said, well, it was the only way it would work. Until that meeting, now that I look back, I find it a little surprising that until that meeting, I only considered this change of direction, this reversal of direction, in terms of the solution to a design difficulty, in terms of motion and volumes on my board. After that meeting, though, I started wondering, really, what in my, the general meaning of the composition, what did this change of direction really mean? And while I was pondering that, I came across sessions 308 and 309, in which Seth talks about this change of direction. He talks about it in the context of Jane's progress with the sessions, her own ASP classes, her own work, and so on, and in the context of the psychedelic experience. And he says that the ego was created and endowed with physical senses that it may learn to manipulate energy within the material plane, and that this ego exceeded its mandate, so to speak, it became able to only accept knowledge from the physical senses and the physical reality, and it became, I quote, self-conscious action that attempts to set itself apart from action and to consider action as an alien object, unquote. But value fulfillment does march on. And the next development for this ego, says, says, is to seek, open to, perceive, and assimilate inner data. This opening, he says, is an expansion of consciousness, and it changes the ego. And I quote, this altered ego retains its special life self-consciousness, and yet, it can now experience itself as an identity within and as part of action." Unquote. Such is the significance of this re reversal of direction. So now, I see this construction, this action of mine here, as a document. It documents our moment point within value fulfillment. Individually and collectively, we are this ego, which dominates the composition by its exaggerated relative size. We are this ego, which sees itself as the organizing principle of the rest of reality, or framework too. We are also this ego, which becomes increasingly aware that it doesn't work, and that it doesn't work, and that it doesn't work some more that our perspectives do not give us a reliable source of knowledge or of guidance. We are this ego opening to, seeking another perspective, another direction. We are this ego at the edge of expansion, and this documents our pivot point within value fulfillment. In conclusion, 
value fulfillment is the explosive multiplicitude, multiplicitude of the primary energy gestalt of all that is, having fun, getting to know itself, exploring itself through infinite action. Voila.
Thank you.